Chickasaw Medicine Men, known as Alikshi, played a special role in Chickasaw society. They had to have knowledge of roots and plants that made medicine, as well as a spiritual formula or sayings and songs or chants that they would perform over the patient. And it was a holistic form of medicine before holistic medicine was a concept. Historically, most southeastern tribes, including the Chickasaw, believed a healthy person had more than a healthy body. A person's overall well-being also included a healthy spirit, mind, and a positive relationship with the community and nature. Abba Benili gave the animals, trees, rocks, and water a spirit. And it was an individual's responsibility to keep balance and harmony with the environment. If they did so, the creator would provide good health. If their actions were not in harmony with nature, it was their responsibility to make things right. Indian doctors were there to help facilitate the process with a combination of what today we would call counseling, prayer, and medicinal remedies. Chickasaw Medicine Men combined psychological, physiological, and spiritual healing techniques in a holistic application to patients that also involved their family and community. And they often had uh, positive health outcomes for those reasons. Traditional Indian medicine was passed down through the generations. Some early journalists recorded various plants and chants, but the knowledge has eroded away from assaults on native culture and the passage of time. The writings of historians provide a glimpse into the practices of the Indian doctor. Early 19th century writer H.P. Cushman was the son of missionaries who lived among the Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Natchez nations. He wrote the proprietary secrets that existed from one Indian doctor to the next. And he perceived tribal communities, including their medicine, to be superior in many ways. Gideon Lincecum, was an American pioneer, a historian, a physician, and a naturalist in the early 1800s. He also became a believer in tribal medicinal knowledge. He had the chemical medicines, such as mercury and other harsh compounds that were used to treat illnesses in scientific or allopathic medicine at that time. However, in his interaction here on the frontier with Native Americans, Choctaws and Chickasaws, he learned and observed directly their herbal and plant cures and their medical practices, and he was convinced, he was converted. Chickasaws during that time believed spiritual pollution was a primary cause of illness. This idea that everything has a spirit and balance must be maintained between and among all those spirits or how older Chickasaws spoke about how the old beloved speech was being forgotten and this was causing illness and disorder in the tribe. And he blamed things like European intrusion, the introduction of clothing and bodily practices that were not traditional were perceived to cause a breakdown in Chickasaw traditional culture. So understanding all that as a background, illness was perceived uh, not as a strictly physiological disorder. Because of that, the India doctor was not only spiritual, they were also psychological detectives with additional knowledge of ancient herbal remedies. And so the medicine man would talk with them and ask, what happened, where have they been, who have they seen, anything strange that happened. 
things that we re refer to as bad signs or bad omens. Several aspects of Chickasaw traditional medicine fulfilled needs that modern medicine continues to struggle to find ways to do. Studies have shown that doctor-patient relationships have an effect on health outcomes, and Chickasaws knew this hundreds and thousands of years ago. There was the correlation between animal disease and medicinal practice. For example, if one has the red squirrel sickness, then they would need red squirrel medicine. They would have a dance and the most powerful song to accompany the dance. Traditional Chickasaw names for illnesses include animal names, deer sickness, dog sickness. It was a spiritual disorder that needed to be addressed both with plant medicines in the form of a tea or a decoction or a salve and also spiritual atonements. The medicine man sang, recited sacred formula, danced involving a, a rattle or other musical instrument. So addressing the spirits that were in uh, the joints or the, the abdomen or the head or whatever part of the body was afflicted, driving out those bad spirits was the goal. Some of these practices were pretty advanced. Some of the implements that have been discovered at archeological sites were used by Indian doctors in ancient times with variations continuing through the ages. And one of the tools that they used to effect these practices was a bone tube. And this was a length of long bone of an animal. Archaeological specimens found have been identified as deer bone, panther bone, and eagle or swan humerus or wing bone. It's also written in the journals that at one time, other southeastern tribes referred to the Chickasaws as having the most powerful medicine. Everything that Chickasaw people did was spiritual. They didn't make any medicine without the Creator's help. And that's where she got a lot of her herbs. Tony Walker and Rose Jefferson remember some of the practices that were used by a select few to heal their ailments. She had a cane hollowed out, and she would blow into that. She would say like a chant, and then she would blow into that herb and, and bless it. I remember she'd get that horn and put it on there and she'd like suck, you know, like a straw, you know. And then my mom would use cedar. My mom would take that and smoke it in her house and it would just feel like a comfort. Like getting that cedar over there and just kind of smoke in each of the room, you know, for cleansing. I still burn cedar today. Today, much of the knowledge about traditional medicine incorporating spiritual chants has been lost. And only a few have memories of the ceremonies and herbal remedies. The loss of this important practice could be a result of a period in time when Indian culture was under attack. There was a time in the 20th century when our culture was outlawed. People had to hide their Native American identity for their very own survival. So the knowledge of traditional Indian medicine is nearly gone. First of all, it's very important to understand that there are different types of medicine. There is the Alikchi who incorporated spiritual chants and songs with his treatments. And this knowledge was only passed to someone who was chosen. Many believe the Alikchi no longer exist. Their practices are lost. But there are some who still believe. I've heard about those a lot from my, my grandparents and parents and other, other members of the uh, Chickasaw Nation, the elders. They, they chant uh, what we call futpo in our language. is when they say a certain kind of words that is spoken when they're fixed in the medicine. There was a distinct difference on who could practice and how it was passed down from generation to generation. This is how I, it was explained to me. To become an Indian doctor, it was something that you received from God. 
We believe that God, or Baba Neely, chooses who these medicine people will be, and that Baba Neely has created beings on this earth to help train these medicine people. The knowledge of this traditional medicine includes the transfer of knowledge from beings that could be compared to a Christian belief in guardian angels. You were chosen by the little people. And the little people are another aspect of our culture that are very important. Most people call them little people, but in Chickasaw, they're Hatak Sinwa, the meaning little people. And they would take you out wherever they, they lived and they would teach you. The stories of little people are so ingrained in Indian culture, the beliefs extend to other tribes, even those separated by great distance with distinctly different cultures. They have been represented in artwork and depicted as mischievous beings playing tricks, but also teaching children all the knowledge and spiritual understanding of Abba Benili, people and plants. I have never seen but I, I believe it because I've, you know, I've heard my mom talk about uh, what her grandma used to say. They weren't there to harm you. They were there to take care of you. It's like a gift. You have to be chosen in order to, to be a doctor. Indian doctors were believers in, in Jesus Christ. We always prayed and used the medicine. Another type of medicine that I've heard the elders speak about is the bad medicine, things that they could do to you if, if there was such thing as jealousy. Bad medicine included uh, casting spells and some that would uh, transform themselves into different kind of animals. Another source of illness was illness due to witchcraft that would be perpetrated by another person perhaps at the behest of an enemy who would hire a witch to harm the patient. I believe that there are different aspects of bad medicine and from the things that I've been told, if someone so-called shape-shifted from a human form to an animal form. There was good people, the good doctors, and, and there was people who experimented with the bad side of it. They were able to transform themselves. They would transform themselves into hoot owls. They were the evil. We call good and evil. So they were the bad people. You know, I just want people to believe it because there's people who don't believe in it, that it existed and it really did. And then there is the medicine that more of the elders remember, the gathering and use of special plants and herbs to create cures for injuries and ailments. I think this part of that medication so it was handed down a family. The elders who still remember plants and herbal remedies say it is a way of life that is all but gone, and their memories are as precious as the herbs and roots that are so difficult to find today. My grandmother was a doctor, and I learned some things, you know, I still use today. She was an Indian doctor. She took care of our people. We didn't have hospitals or clinics we went to very often. She took care of us with the herbs, which were grown just about two miles from here in their creek. And she would take it to her home, and, and she would do it privately. She wouldn't let us and watch. And he would go out middle of the night and find some kind of root and boil it and let it cool and pour it in his ear and stop the hearing. When I was growing up, my mother and you know, my grandmother and other relatives used Indian medicine, and they talked about it a lot. There was some roots that they gathered, which was called red roots. Then my father, he doctored for your throat, your tongue palate. That's what we call the tongue palate. Like if you spring your ankle real bad and stuff like that. There was a tree out in the woods back behind the pasture. It was called sycamore. Then I had some uncles in my family that did toothache. My mom used to doctor us for colds. She used to call this medicine walk billa. She'd say, go get my walk billa. My grandma, she sassafras. My mom did too, said that was good for everything. People would come all over if they knew that you knew how to do medicine. We were so far out. Matter of fact, I don't think, I didn't know doctors existed. We were so far out. But this is how we survived in the way they cook things. Chickasaw artist Brent Greenwood says traditional healing is part of the Chickasaw culture, 
has had an impact on his life and his art. We don't have as many traditional healers that we used to have. And there again, it was that connection with nature and the environment, because they knew where to get all those herbs and all those roots and all those flowers. And they had that knowledge. And so that's something that is passed on, but it has to be to a special individual. And although my grandmother wasn't a healer, I've known of women of her generation that were. And I've known of firsthand accounts of people that have been healed by healers or what we call Indian doctors. So much like the arts, you know, it's something that is passed on, but it's also something that is kind of a calling. It really did shape my views on how I feel about who I, who I am as a person and the connectedness I have to my culture, because it's not myth, it's not legend. Indian medicine was embraced by the entire community with one special healing ceremony that many elders still remember. When we had a real, real bad sick people person, they would cook this prashofa. One of the last healing ceremonies that our current elder generation can remember is the pashofa ceremony. Pashofa aside from being a, a traditional food, actually referred to a, a dance or ceremony. They would usually have it in the person's front yard. They'd have a big fire and dancing. It gave a form of social support to the patient by having the family and community there, which doctors and scientists today have proven has a positive effect on health outcomes. And uh, there's something to be said that, about that. My dad said he was just a kid then, and what he'd do is he'd just sit and watched him. He said uh, he liked to listen to the songs. He said, I sure did like to listen to those songs. So most certainly the, the music, the environment, the event itself um, could, could have some, some effect. Today, there is some hesitation to talk about traditional practices which leads to even more loss of knowledge for a younger generation of Chickasaw people. I think the reason that a lot of elders are hesitant to talk about much of our culture is because a lot of them attended boarding schools. And by that time, once they go to boarding school, everything is stripped away from them that is culture, everything. The prevalence of unwillingness to discuss medicinal plants in Southeastern culture could likely be attributed to a taboo about the development of that knowledge from a child and um, sharing that knowledge with someone who's not worthy. There's certain times that you have to gather these plants. There's certain phases of the moon. Some you can only gather at nighttime. Some you can only gather in the day. The keepers of the knowledge are reluctant to share that knowledge with someone who doesn't show the, the utmost interest and dedication because they don't want those plants to be over harvested or, um, or those practices to be sullied. Holistic and homeopathic medicine is experiencing renewed interest today. Maybe it's because of a distrust of pharmaceuticals and chemicals with harsh side effects. Maybe it's because of a desire to live more simply in balance with nature, to go back to our roots to be able to go out and live on one's own or, or to take care of their family um, with their own hands, uh, I think um, drives a lot of that interest. People are realizing that there were aspects of traditional indigenous Native American and Chickasaw medicine healing practices that would still be beneficial and valid today. While Western medicine has developed drugs that are more efficacious in some cases than plants and herbs, but we should note that many of these drugs are based on compounds originally identified in plants and herbs. Progress and science have displaced the need for traditional knowledge. <laughs> it could done so good. <laughs> and even the elders agree, many of the old ways are fading. The language is becoming obsolete. The medicine went before our language because nobody practices it anymore. 
we're realizing all of us, you know, as we get older, um, the folks that we could have garnered some uh, degree of, of knowledge about the plants or, or wild harvesting, wild medicines are passing away or getting too old. Today, seven out of the 10 top medicines listed as very good medicine are Indian medicine. The echinacea and the yarrow and the monarda, all of these were our medicines that we used hundreds of years ago. We are at a critical juncture in time to save important knowledge of Chickasaw uh, herbal and plant medicines. This information can die with the current generation of elders. We're down to very few people having the knowledge and all that's gonna be left is what we can read from a book. It would be a terrible loss to Chickasaw culture to have the identities and uses of many of these native plants to be lost forever. And so there is a new sense of urgency to preserve the knowledge that remains, to document the plants that carried the medicine for generations of Chickasaw people. To find this aspect of the Chickasaw culture, the part that still grows wild and untouched in the homeland. I love going back to the homelands and it influences my dreams. Knowing that an ancestor has been here or had dwelled there or even touching the same tree that I'm walking past along the same path, it gives me goosebumps. Stephen Bond is on a journey to find as many species of traditional medicinal plants as he can locate and photograph, then consult with elders to create an authentic directory for future generations of Chickasaw. We're documenting the traditionally important species um, both in Oklahoma and in the homelands to provide a more enlightened view of the Chickasaw's use of their natural environments. The diversity is expansive. Every time I come, I find new things. I always have a, a moment when I'm in the canyon where I um, am just awestruck of the plant use of, our, of the Chickasaw ancestors. It's very important that we, we come out here. Uh, many of the species that uh, were traditionally used aren't represented in, in Oklahoma now. For our ancestors, they would have gathered medicines in these woods. Um, they would have sought shelter in these woods. So although the Chickasaw people don't live here now, this is still a, a highly valued area of biodiversity um, for folks in northern Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee. The tradition or culture of wild harvest is still valued. There will be an abundance of ferns and medicinal plants will abound throughout here. I have to go to great lengths to find um, some of these, these rare species in a landscape across the country that's been altered, especially in the last hundred years. Oh, there is some. This is green dragon. So you can see the cluster of, of red fruit here on a, born on a single uh, stem. It's a very potent, uh, dangerous medicinal for folks to use that aren't familiar with it. This is a, a, a strong medicinal plant that would have a, an immediate effect and it, it, it'll induce sweat and um, cause you to, um, I think the prevailing idea was to sweat out the toxins and it'll make you vomit, um, which was also a way to get out the, the toxins for whatever particular illness it was they were treating. That green dragon, erysima, ironweed. It's a species of ironweed and it's a you know dry flower top, so that'd be a nice image to get. So this is the Laminaceae family, or mint family, and they all have an aromatic um, foliage to them. And just like mint is uh, medicinal now, um, it would bear some medicinal use um, for the ancestors. So we've, we've got cottonwood here. This is Hashomala in Chikashanumpa. And this is one of the first species that I documented being in common use today with our group of elders that still cherish the traditional medicine plants. I was asked to harvest some bark initially by a group of elders and was instructed to only take bark from the east side of the tree. When the Chickasaw people were forced from their homeland east of the Mississippi River, 
They not only had to rebuild their lives and communities in Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, they had to adapt to a new environment. They had to adapt to a new climate, new plant species, and fewer of the plants that had been an important part of their way of life. This is a, one of the places that would have had a lot of traditionally important species of the Chickasaw that would have uh, also been familiar to the, to the folks that were originally here. So this would have been drinking water, this would have been a place to gather medicine, it would have been a place to gather food. And there's a lot of novel species here relative to the surrounding area. They're not as abundant, and although they were familiar, they, they were different. They were smaller. Progress has a way of sacrificing the natural world and its bounty. As towns emerged, communities grew, and land was cultivated. Habitat for wild species of plant life was lost, even with good intentions. So we're looking at buckthorn, Ramnus frangiloides, and we see that there's plenty of berries left on this plant because it's um, very toxic. But the key element here is that when we wild harvest, we need to be with folks that are knowledgeable about the plants. This is a, a beautiful charismatic plant. Um, it's relatively rare and these berries are toxic and is known to put people into comas. There's an ancient wisdom to many of these medicinal and traditionally used plants, and, and we need to bring some of that wisdom along so we can learn from our elders um, what um, is beneficial and what is dangerous. I still like to learn the medicine that we used, because there might be a time that uh, I need something like that. It's dying, and once it's gone, completely gone, don't, you know, the new generation, they'll never know. I always refer to a lot of it like wild onions. You pick wild onions one year, the next year you can go back, and they're not anymore. They're, they're gone. So the medicine was the same way. It, once you used it up, it kind of, it never came back. I wouldn't even know what they look like now if I was to go look for the, the medicine. Probably it's, it's all gone. It's been so long you know, ago. All of our older people that was teaching us, they're gone now. Chickasaw medicine is so very important to our culture that it is my hope that our young people today will understand how important it is and will put forth the effort to learn from their elders all that they can. And they need to learn all they can while they can. It does make me sad too understand now that I'm older how important that these different things were to our tribe and to our people. They're being lost and it makes me wish that I had paid closer attention. We're still here. We don't have everything we used to have. Maybe the all the traditional medicines we used to have, but there's a connection still there and it's with me today. So I think that Bob and Ely, he knew the course and he's with us and he's guiding us. Today, young Chickasaws have an opportunity to embrace the culture that has been preserved for them, just as their Chickasaw ancestors embraced the knowledge from their elders. We give them room to make their own decisions, their own thoughts and opinions about who they are as Chickasaw people and we have a strong identity today, and it's being taken into the future. <laughs>